Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Season 3. Season 3 is all about durable futures, and since the last episode, I've taken yet another attack at refactoring this to make it a little more usable, a little more sensible, and I wanted to just kind of go over what the latest changes are before pushing it up to GitHub, because I know some of you have been kind of looking for some changes, and I've had some comments and a lot of feedback. And I want to just kind of bring it back together. So I'm going to jump right into some of the code, just kind of review how the changes have been made, and then uh, push this up to GitHub so y'all can take a look at it. So um, just to kind of recap with season three, this is all about building a new feature of mass transit. And the entire journey of season three has been around this concept of how we can take the paradigm of request response and turn it into something that I'm calling a durable future. Uh, this gives us a great programming model. Um, I think it's going to be really slick. Um, if you haven't watched the earlier episodes, there's definitely a lot of build up to where we're at. And you can, you can clearly see by looking at the code, the amount of churn and the amount of thought that goes into making a feature consumable and usable by developers. Um, so I'm going to dig into this a little bit. If you haven't watched the earlier episodes, catch some of those beforehand. This will look a lot cleaner than the earlier syntax. So anyway, that should get you up to speed. So I'm gonna start with a very simple future. So this durable future is a request response. And what it has is we have, the, we have the fry cook where we cook the fries and the fries are ready. And previously this had a number of different overrides and a lot of class inheritance stuff that I just, I'm not a big fan of, especially when it comes into trying to be able to get some cohesiveness in the code. So what I've done is I've really kind of dried this up and I think it's, it's gonna make a lot of sense as I kind of step through it. Um, there's two input types and the second one we don't have to worry about. This is just an attempt of me to kind of wrap some things up. Um, but remember when the future requested event comes in, that's the order ID, the order line item that, that initiates the request and that's when this order fry command comes in. And we're gonna complete that with the fry completed command. Um, and you can see this is gonna use a request response consumer that I send a cook fry command to, and it's gonna do a fry ready. So we really have a consumer, the durable future, and then anybody that wants to talk to it can use that. So the request future, this used to have a lot of code. Really all I care about is the response because the fault that gets generated by this is just a fault of order fry. And the system, I've put a bunch of code underneath the covers that knows how to build all that. And I'll go through that in a little bit. Um, so here, all I'm doing is defining the response. And I only have to define properties that are distinct to this future. So for instance, the input type order fry has size and it has the order line ID and the order ID. So all of that stuff is in the inbound request. Those properties are gonna be used to initialize the response automatically. So all I have to do is add what's new to the response. In this case, order line completed has a description field. And that's the only thing I'm initializing in the response initializer here. Uh, I could do this two different ways. I could change this out, but once I go through it all, I'll show some of the options that we have. So the fry future is super simple. I think I left the code in the shake future just to kind of show that I could copy some additional message properties. Uh, the layering happens and when we have a completed event, the layering is it copies a bunch of properties from the instance. And here I can just actually go out and show this because it'll give you an idea. Um, it's in here. You can see the first thing that gets initialized is all the properties from the instance, which are the date and time stamps. So if you have a created, completed, faulted, whatever. I then initialize it with the response message. So the response that comes back is then used to initialize it. And then I use a destination address provider, which this is the, um, actually this is the command. Yeah, this doesn't sound right. This is the command. Yeah, this isn't the right one. I want the response endpoint. So I want the future response. So the future response, yeah, so here we go. So here are the response. The response is gonna initialize with those same properties. It's gonna then use the request to initialize any properties. It's then going to use the response received from the other consumer to initialize properties. Then it's gonna to go to your actual dictionary to get some properties. 
So a lot of layers of initialization here, but the whole point is like, if you already have a value that was in one of the previous things, it just auto initializes it for you. So you don't have to move that stuff around. So that's kind of the intent there. Uh, once the initializer is out there, it creates that message, it saves it in the future, and then sends a message to all the subscriptions that says, hey, everybody wants a copy of this. Um, so that's kind of how the response part works. And I have these types for response, fault, and command. So the command is actually sent by the fry future, but it's a default because cook fry and order fry have a lot of the same properties. So it just automatically copies them. Whereas when I went to the shake future, you could see that I was actually initializing the command. Even though the flavor and size properties are there, I could add additional properties to format the command that I'm doing here. And then this is the response one where I'm only adding that description, that response property. So these command response and then fault is one more that can be configured, but it's configured by default to just handle fault type. So there isn't anything special to do there. Um, and you can take a look down in here. Fault actually, I believe, goes all the way down. Um, the default fault configurator is there. Yeah, so that's kind of how that is. Um, but you could customize the fault if you wanted to put additional things like headers and stuff like that. And you can put headers in these. So if you were to put something like uh, using the header syntax of, I think it's underscore, underscore, name, underscore, value something i can't remember what it is it's like headers there's a way you can initialize the headers i think it's like headers underscore header name something like that equals and you could initialize that and you could actually put headers on the actual message property as well and those will get initialized on the outbound command um, but again this isn't really needed because all the properties are there it's just kind of showing what the capabilities are uh, I think the shake future is pretty dumb oh wait no that is the shake future what's the other one? Oh, onion rings yeah, onion rings, again, we're just setting that description on the response type, not a whole lot to do there. This mapping is currently needed. I'm thinking about other ways to do this, um, but this is the individual future ID for each order line. Um, it would be nice if I could do this by convention somehow, just by specifying a, a property access for order line ID, and then I can configure the event properly myself. That's something else I'm thinking about, but not there yet. Um, so those are the request response futures. The burger future has changed as well because it's routing slip based, but again, very simple. Um, we have the initializer, which is going to, for the response, again, we're gonna get the variable from the routing slip variables, uh, from the routing slip completed event, and we're going to then return that anonymous type that'll be used to initialize the completed message. So in this case, burger completed includes the burger. And all we're doing here is setting the burger and then the description for the order line because a burger is, is an order line. Um, this is still, again, using the routing slip future, which has kind of been cleaned up. Here you can see the fault. The routing slip future actually does configure the fault for the routing slip type. And you can see it's just taking that, in this case, the routing slip faulted event, using that instance, getting the request, and generating a fault of T for the initial request that came into the routing slip future, it's formatting that out so that it's in the context of a fault of T, because that's the contract that we've kind of said is, you know, that's, that's the fault type for a request, so we want to stick and be continuous with that. Um, the execute routing slip activity is still basically the same. It does the, uh, there are a couple of changes. First of all, the the tracking number is unique each time because I'm gonna add retry. I started to add retry and then I thought I would take a break and do a snapshot of the code. Um, so I'm initiating a new tracking number for each routing slip, which is the best behavior. You should be doing that anyway. And then I add the future ID as a variable to the routing slip builder. So that gives me a variable within the routing slip that I can tie back and I actually use that to correlate to the routing slip future by default. So you can see the routing slip completed it correlates on future ID or fault, which basically says I get that future ID variable out of the routing slip, uh, completed or faulted events. And if I can't find it, it's an exception. That, that should be there. If it isn't there, that's a fault. Things go bad otherwise. So that's how those run. I did add some missing instance handlers. So retry would take place and, and be able to correlate back if there was an issue. Of course, we're using the outbox, so nothing should be sent that isn't saved. So that's good. 
Um, and then I cleaned up the way some of the set completed works. A lot of the, this used to do a bunch of overrides and everything if you were looking at the old code base. Now it's just using those response or fault objects to actually just send the response to those subscribers. So that's what's happening there. Um, I think the base future, I'm trying to remember if I finished that. Um, the, the other one to look at is this order line, not order line completed, um, the order line future. And this is our join future. This is the one that has multiple items that are joined together into a single response. Um, in this case, there are two of them that do that. One is our fry shake that makes a fry and makes a shake and then ties them back together into a single response. Uh, in this case, you can see we're getting the request so that we have access to the size and flavor. Um, we could just as well look at the, um, the results that came back. And in the case of the order future, we actually do go back to the instance and get the results, the faults, the exceptions, and build out those arrays and initialize those things properly. Um, yeah, so you, here you can see we're initializing a fault to a custom fault type, which is order faulted, which just has its own uh, details in it. So a little bit to discover. None of this is documented yet because, again, we're just trying to explore this feature to see how it, how it works out and how it makes sense. Um, yeah, so this order future has the response and the fault, and those are really just the joins that we have coming in here um, because it keeps the order line future keeps track of all the lines. As each line completes, it saves it, saves a copy of it, tracks pending lines, does all of that join type stuff to do that many back to one for that fan out, concurrent fan out, and then ultimately response and correlation back. Um, and again, its fault is pretty crazy. It actually gets the request. It gets all the faults that happened within the routing slip, ties them together, gets an initial one, clumps all the exceptions together, basically builds this gigantic fault response and throws it all together. So pretty crazy. Um, but that's what you would do when you would fan out and come back. That's like task when all returns an array of completions or it returns an aggregate exception of all the exceptions. So it's, it's really trying to do the same thing and follow that task of T, which is kind of the C-sharp's future of T, trying to model and kind of interpret that behavior in a distributed system. So that's kind of the, kind of the entire inspiration for how we're building out these durable futures in the system. So. Um, I don't have too much more to kind of dig into the code at this point. I mean, it's, it's coming along. I think it's gonna make sense. I have, like I said, I have retry and stuff to do to where I can actually retry at the future level and basically do like smart durable futures. So that's another piece that I'm kind of working on and thinking basically on the notebook right now, but you know, drawing it out and kind of figuring out how it makes sense. Cause I wanna be able to support cancellation and deadlines as well. So that's, that's another item that I want to cover at some point before getting this ready to go. So definitely throw some feedback on this. The code is going to be out there. All of the code that's actually considered runtime code at this point is in the fork joint components side. So I moved all of that out. Um, and I have a number of different configurators. I've kind of tried to make it follow the mass transit syntax for how it's built together. Uh, the future state has changed a little bit. It's kind of cleaned up. So you will need to delete your old database and reapply the migration that comes with the uh, API project as well. Um, because I changed some of the types and put some smartness in here, added some fields, I store the request. Um, I added variables. I'm actually gonna make variables be a part of the uh, future data store since it's just one more property. And if it's initialized, you know, we'll be able to actually store some variables in there similar to how we do with the routing slip. I thought that would be a useful tool. Um, I haven't really thought of much else in here. Um, again, I'm trying to keep everything null when possible. So if there isn't anything on it, it, um, it will not set it. So basically it'll leave those columns as null in the database. Um, the one thing I wanted to check on the base future to see if I had done it, if I could find it, not yet, somewhere in here. Uh, is the initial responder. So like if it's completed, we want to, okay, yeah, so these are, yeah, so get completed just goes out and gets the completed message from the routing slip and returns it. So it doesn't rebuild those messages twice. It essentially, anytime you respond or fault, it's going to save those values and be able to return those back out. So those are all still in there. Um, so yeah, that's still handled. So if you ask for it again, and if I run this, if I do our single test here where we had like the burgers, fries, and a shake, this is actually running in the debugger right now, and you can go out and see the, 
the output, you know, as it's running, actually you won't see the output there. You'd see RabbitMQ outputting, but you can see that the line's completed. I got my chocolate shake, my small fries, and my uh, burger. So that's all good. Um, and then, you know, some of the initial shorter ones work too. Like if I just want fries, which I think this just gets fries. Oh, this gets fries and shake. Awesome. But it still should just take like a minute to come back because these both run pretty quick. So, and those get completed out. So I think the code's getting in a lot more consumable state. So, you know, with that, I'm going to finish this video. I'm going to push this code up to GitHub so you can check it out. I didn't do the Twitch stream this time because I just wanted to knock this out quick and it was a Sunday afternoon and I wanted to be able to restart. So I'm probably going to be posting some of these more to YouTube just when they're short recaps like this. Um, so anyway, that's where the code is at right now. I'll get it up on GitHub and uh, thanks for checking it out.